This episode of the podcast is supported by Audible. You can download and listen to the world's best storytelling. I use it all the time to and from work. You can listen to audiobooks, original series and more on their free app. To get your free 30-day subscription, which includes a free book, click on the link in our show notes and enjoy. Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. Today I had a great guy come in and speak to me, Dr. Viren Swamy, who is a professor of social psychology at Anglia Ruskin University in Cambridge. And we talked about paternal postnatal depression, depression amongst fathers, and not often talked about so many fathers and men are going through this it's uh, it was eye-opening so we had a deep conversation we talked around all the issues uh, really powerful and i hope you enjoy it hey it's lewis welcome to the podcast enjoy our conversations anytime anywhere cool i'm alive how you doing good yeah. I'm well. How are you? Good. Thanks for coming. Did you find it okay? <laughs> <laughs> I got very, very lost. Um, got that, I, I don't think I've ever found it, even with very clear instructions. I know. The Google Maps just doesn't work as well no. nowadays. It sent me to a different place. It sent me to a car park. Oh, unbelievable. Everyone always gets lost now. I've asked the same question to like the last. That doesn't make me feel any better. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So, um, so what's your background? What do, you, what do you do? My official title is I am Professor of Social Psychology at Anglia Ruskin University. What that simply means is is that I am a researcher and a lecturer in social psychology. I study all kinds of things, everything from body image to why people voted Brexit. But one of the things I'm particularly interested in is what we call mental health literacy, which is essentially how non-scientists think about and their beliefs about mental illness. The kind of background here is that I, I became a dad about just over two years ago now, and after my son was born, then I struggled with my own mental health, and that got me interested in the research that existed on postnatal depression, particularly in men. And there isn't much, is there? Well, there isn't very much at all, although I think what exists in terms of research knowledge is very different to what exists in the public realm. Oh, I so see, in yeah. very simple terms, the public generally don't believe that postnatal depression affects men, whereas in my academics, we know it does. Interesting. I was speaking to a friend of mine... Um, um, to say I was having this podcast and she was like what are you talking about this is complete rubbish I won't mention who she is but she knows who she is um, <laughs> no it's definitely a big problem just winding back a little bit what, what was it like having your your first kid and what were you expecting and I'm not sure what I was expecting I think I, lots of people ask me this question like what did I expect before my son was born and I'm not sure I had any real expectations I kind of went into it more or less blind I think that was part of the problem really that I kind of had no idea what to expect um, so I kind of took each day as it came and I think to be honest I think looking back, I think even before our son was born, I think I was probably already struggling. I certainly had a lot of anxiety. Like, so during the pregnancy? Yeah, during so. my wife's pregnancy. Like, a lot of anxiety is normal. Like, lots of dads will worry about the future and money and all kinds of things. My anxiety kind of got to the point where I was, at times, not all the time, but at times, I think, really struggling to understand what was happening. I would worry about leaving the house. I kind of almost treated my wife's pregnancy as if it didn't exist. Yeah, like treated her like she was just a completely everyday person with no pregnancy involved. Yeah, yeah. It's easy, yeah, you're not really prepared so much. Oh, I've got two kids and um, my classic, and my friends will laugh at me, but my classic line was always like, life's never going to change. Mm. Like, it's mm. not going to change. Because, you know, before when it's just you and your wife or you and your husband or whatever, you're out, you can sleep in, you can like, go partying yeah. and all of those things yeah. and you don't really expect it to change or you don't want it to change and you don't want to let it change I think it's both isn't it it's not wanting it to change and not also not expecting it to change um, and obviously when when it happens change comes very very quickly yeah. I, I often think like, it's really weird that the kind of setup in the UK is that you're given birth and you're told go home it's all yours now that's it yeah, yeah, go yeah, and deal with everything. <laughs> yeah that's, that's essentially what happened with us So because also we don't have I was speaking to my colleague Maria just, just before back in the day like we used to the villages used to bring up kids yeah, yeah. and now if you're in a city yeah. you might have your parents nearby you might not i think you're lucky if you have your parents nearby yeah but most people are quite estranged and we don't have that kind of natural support network no it's true you yeah. just like crack on and you're in the i think part of the problem as well though is is that society as a whole tells us that when your child arrives it's going to be a magical moment it's going to be this momentous moment and everything will be right you'll understand instantly what everything is going to be perfect i remember when the first time i held my son properly he must have been a couple of minutes old at this point. I didn't really feel anything. It's a strange feeling looking back now. I remember there's a photo of me. Someone took a photo of me holding my son for the first time. And I look at that photo and I'm doing all the outwardly. I'm doing all the kind of things you'd expect me to do. I'm smiling. I'm, I'm looking at the camera. You'd think I was happy. Inwardly, I felt completely numb. There was, there was no feeling. There was no emotion. And it took me a long time to understand that that was a symptom in itself. That you, yeah. that, that when you experience something like that, you'd, exp you'd hope to feel something. But 
I wasn't really feeling anything. What's also interesting is that you have no idea that other dads probably are feeling exactly the same. Yeah, yeah. Because no one really talks about it. Um, and it's, I think it's a very common, you know, because again, when, it, when with my kids as well, it's not like this sudden thunderbolt of like, oh my God, you know, I can't yeah, love this, this yeah. kid as much as I, you know, all of these things. Yeah. So I think we, we definitely need to talk about it more. I'm assuming postnatal depression is, is researched or very well researched in, in mothers. Yeah. Uh, so there is a ton of research firstly showing yeah. that it exists and what we do about it and what the effects are and all kinds of things. So it's very, very well researched. Yeah. And what, what are the symptoms if we're talking so about the, mothers? And so it is clinical classic depression. Right. Sorry, major depression. Um, most people would be have an awareness of what depression is. So it's essentially a lack of persistent enjoyment of life or any kind of things that you enjoyed in the past typically associated with low self-esteem right also uh, commonly associated with low energy okay so if it's diagnosed in the period after a birth usually up to a year after the birth of a child then we call it postnatal depression so it's just depression i don't mean just depression but it's clinical depression following the birth of a child Okay, and and you said so for a year. But how long does it last for? Well, there is no <laughs> cut off in that sense. Right. Um, if a person isn't treated, it can last for, for several years. With men, what we see is often it ends up in in sometimes not always, but sometimes ends in suicide. So it doesn't always mean that it just gets better over time, or there is a clear cut off. Um, if it if it is prolonged, um, most therapists would consider it major depression again. Is there an effect on the on the baby with the mothers? So if the mother's depressed, yeah. So if the mum's depressed, they're less like less likely to interact with their child in the first place. Um, for right. example, they're less likely to breastfeed, or they breastfeed for shorter durations. They're also less likely to interact positively with their child playing, reading, that kind of thing. In the longer term, there's also an impact on the on the child outcomes. So the the child is much more likely to develop behavioural and linguistic problems, right. uh, right. particularly in late childhood. So a whole host of outcomes, negative outcomes, both in terms of the mother-child attachment, but also in terms of the child itself. Is there a difference do you find between whether uh, it's a it's a boy or girl? Not in terms of the mum's symptoms. So the, right. the symptoms in terms of the mums are exactly the same. Right. The, there is some research to suggest that boys, in particular, boys who have a mum who is clinically depressed, uh, are more likely to develop behavioural problems in later life. In particular, right. it's thought that because boys don't get the nourishment early in life, they're much more likely to replicate those difficulties those mental health difficulties in later life and they just and they, and they remember this from the first year it's so not so much that they remember they just haven't I think one of the problems if if, if the mum hasn't been given long term care for example yeah. the child is impacted long term as well um, and boys for all kinds of different reasons but social reasons in particular are just not given the tools to ask for help yeah. Uh, so the, the outcomes tend to kind of become more extreme in boys. And for for and for mothers, um, I'm assuming there's there's a lot of like uh, a care available, help available. Is yeah. it well noticed? I know when we had our kid, the um, the nurse used to come and visit us in the flat and, yeah. and check how she was. Yeah. I, in the UK, we certainly do. Yeah. Um, I mean, the whole tradition of midwifery, the tradition of health visiting, is geared towards looking after mum. Yeah. If I mean, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the health visitor will ask questions of your wife. They probably wouldn't have asked questions of you. I don't even think I had to be there. Mm, exactly. In terms of both practical policy, so for example, the, the NHS at the moment have a policy of, of routinely screening all new mums for mental illness. And they don't have a similar policy for men. And when do they when do they do that? So is that during uh, during the antenatal period? Uh, so prenatally, they will yeah. have a routine. Um, quite uh, someone will ask them a question about their mental health, mental history, yeah. and if it's deemed to be at risk, they will get follow up care. And men don't get the same routine questioning. The NHS is now moving to a system where men whose partners have postnatal depression will get routine care, but it still means that men who have a history of mental illness, for example, will not be asked about their mental illness. Crazy. Hmm. It's crazy. How come there's not been more research done? I think there has been quite a bit in terms of of, um, understanding certainly the, the female perspective or the yeah. mum's perspective. Yeah. I think historically one of the problems was that it just no one really thought that men could get postnatal depression. And that kind of reflects what we th- still think in terms of public awareness of postnatal, postnatal depression. How come? So what the kind of like just man up, crack on, you didn't have the baby? I think one it. of the kind of big myths of postnatal depression is that it's caused by neurochemical changes. Uh, so this idea that women who are pregnant will experience neurochemical changes, things yeah. like changes in testosterone, prolactin, estrogen, and the common idea is that men don't experience that. So so they can't get postnatally depressed. In fact, re- recent research has suggested that men ha- experience changes not just after birth, but even during the wife's pregnancy, uh, in terms of changes in testosterone, prolactin. All oh, right, so yeah. chemical. So all these new chemical changes. changes are happening in men as well. I think the other big myth is that everything that happens during pregnancy are kind of pre- risk factors for 
Um, what would you mean? So, so for example, if you're, if the mum has a complication during birth, that might place her at increased risk for depression. And obviously men don't get pregnant, so they can't yeah. get postnatal depression. I think what the, the kind of problem with that argument again, though, is that it kind of essentially treats the, the dad as a bystander. Uh, that you're kind of taking him out of the family unit and you're saying anything that happens to the family unit doesn't affect him as an individual. Yeah. And of, obviously it does. It, it's a kind of very simple example. If, if the mum is struggling to breastfeed, the dad might feel like that's his responsibility to try and help, but you may end up feeling like he can't do anything. No, it's true. Also, if your wife is breastfeeding, you can't do anything. And, and if you're exactly. not doing, using a bottle yeah. that's just breastfeeding, yeah. I mean, you're just, you're doing nothing, right? Yeah. I mean, maybe cleaning a few uh, a few nappies and, if anything, yeah. you know, and, that, and that's it. And then obviously, depending on how long your wife chooses to breastfeed for, because it's their decision, yeah. mostly, um, you might not do anything for a, a year or so. Yeah. But the kind of, the, the, the general point though, is that anything that acts as a stressor can trigger postnatal depression, whether it's mums or dads. Yeah. And in that sense, there really isn't anything different in terms of the kind of risk factors and, and causes of postnatal depression. Right. Anything that acts as a stressor. And obviously some things will affect mums disproportionately, the fact that they might be more tired because they look doing more aftercare during the postnatal period. But all of these things also affect dads. The kind of the kind of the general line from researchers now is that there isn't a single cause of postnatal depression. It's called it's essentially what we call a multifactorial etiology. All that simply means is that there are lots of causes and there can be lots of different causes. Um, in men, another classic example, something we've already touched on which is the kind of discrepancy between what men expect and what the reality of childbirth is yeah not just yeah. childbirth but also the postnatal period so whether so whether fathers are actually prepared for life after the child's born yeah i before before we had our, our son i don't think i ever saw a newborn i don't think i'd ever seen one in real really? life i mean like just held it and yeah. yeah but women often do and they often have more experiences like that um, yeah i'm not saying that necessarily changes how you experience your own child being born but still it means that they they are often they might be having more conversations or different conversations about childbirth about postnatal um, the postnatal period and so on the other thing is men generally don't talk to other dads about postnatal period I and mean, we don't say don't talk to i don't oh, maybe this is just me but i don't remember having a conversation with my dad about what it's going to be like I, I definitely didn't. Yeah. I definitely didn't. It's interesting because you know you go to the uh, the antenatal classes and the whole thing's geared up for you supporting a wife, mm. which is for sure like massively important. Yeah. But also, I think if they can pair dads for because you know at the moment you know there's a big stigma attached to dads who want to stay at home and look after their yeah. kids. There's yeah. a big stigma attached to dads who want to take longer paternity leave. Yeah, you know, a friend of mine was able to take six months and he went to his boss and he was like, "Hey, I'm going to take six months," and the guy was like, "Really?" Mm. you sure you want to take six months? Yeah. You know, it's yeah. kind of, you know, guys, mostly I think you're expected to like crack on, yeah. get back to work. Yeah. And then suddenly you're, you're like, I've got someone else to support. So yeah. I need to make sure I'm making money. And your relationship changes a lot because it's just you and your wife. Yeah. And suddenly there's like baby that your wife's spending all their time yeah. on and yeah. you're getting shouted at or <laughs> whatever. And if, you, if at that particular moment in time you're struggling with your mental health, it's going to be difficult. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, 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 one of the things that people often, not often, but sometimes say about dads who are struggling with their mental health is that they're jealous of their partners um, or they're jealous that they've lost their partners to their child. I often find those kind of comments kind of patronising. For me, when I was struggling, I never, I was never, I never felt jealous of my wife. I wanted what she had with my son. I, I wanted to feel what she was feeling, and for me, as a kind of almost as an outsider looking at their relationship, it looked like the relationship that I wanted. And yeah. at that point, I didn't feel anything. I was struggling so every day was a kind of a battle to do the kind of basic things like wake up and brush my teeth. And in my head, I'd be constantly fighting these battles against this the kind of what I call the depressed voice, was talking to me and saying you're not you're an unfit parent or you're you're not good enough you can't do this and when you're constantly fighting those thoughts in your head every single day it takes away all your energy and do you think this is a combination of the hormonal changes and also just the li big life change of having a kid and yeah I mean, I mean you'll know this is, this is the sleepless yeah. nights and yeah, yeah and it's it happens suddenly there's like a almost like a kind of plateau where everything is fine and then suddenly you have the child at home again and suddenly you're not sleeping yeah um, and a lot of dads might even go back to work after a couple of weeks oh so, most do yeah yeah, yeah definitely so you're managing both this fact that you're just not sleeping you're not getting enough sleep with the fact that you're back at work and you're having to, to do all the kind of normal things you do at work um, which all can be can place a huge strain on the dad some people say you dads can't get postnatal repressed the kind of short answer is that all the risk factors are there everything that could trigger postnatal depression or if you want to put it differently all the triggers that could trigger depression in the postnatal period 
are there for the dead. Yeah, a lot of people denying that it's it's the case. So I think a lot of people still don't want to believe that it can affect men. I think well, I think there are two reasons. I think one is that it feels quite transgressive in terms of what men are expected to be during the postnatal period. I think a lot of dads are told or sold this narrative that they have to toughen up, they have to be the rock of the family. This is the moment when they show that they can do everything. They can go to work and they can bring home an income. And they can look after the child. They can do everything like this wonderful superhuman individual. And I think any time a man then goes, I'm struggling here, I think a lot of people take it as an almost a kind of transgressive act in terms of his masculinity. It's almost like it's, it's saying I, you, you're not allowed to say you're struggling with your mental health. Yeah, no, 100%, 100%. It's interesting, when, when, we, uh, when we had our first kid, a good friend of mine had theirs about two weeks before. Um, the husband of my friend, obviously both really good friends, he was telling me about the story of you know, the heart rate dropped and the alarms yeah. went off and they got rushed into the emergency C-section and stuff. And he was telling me a bit about you know, how he was feeling and stuff. And then when we, ha- I had exactly the same experience, like the alarms went off and I'm like, ah, oh, you know, that's how, uh, that's how my friend, what he experienced. And so yeah. because we'd spoken yeah. about it, I was like probably a lot calmer. Yeah than I used to be Um, but that's kind of an outlier most of the time you know if I'm speaking to my mates um, guy mates they're not really sharing like stories about how difficult it was or the challenges women though I mean if I'm speaking to my my girlfriends they're much more they they, they share and they talk a lot more about it I I mean this is a a much more broader pattern of what's happening in in, yeah. in, in, in social life at the moment. It's boys aren't taught how to, and boys and men aren't taught how to say, I'm struggling. Boys are essentially taught all the time that you have to strive for this version of masculinity where you're always tough, you're always robust. I think with, with parenthood, that slightly changes a bit. I think there is a, a, a kind of version of positive masculinity where dads strive to be better human beings for their family. But I think overall, masculinity and, and striving for this idealized version of masculinity where you're tough and robust and self-reliant essentially means you're not given the space and the tools to be able to say I'm struggling here I think one of the big difficulties and this is certainly true of me is that when when men start to struggle with their mental health they normalize the behavior they essentially say I'm not dead therefore everything must be okay um, right. essentially what that does is it says all everything that's happening to me right now can be reframed as non-mental illness I'm not depressed because I'm surviving I'm doing everything I need to do might be still going to work for me it was, I would still be able to go to work and yeah, yeah. look like I was functioning I might pop to the gym or do all the kind of things that you'd expect outwardly I would still be doing and so that kind of validates this assumption that I'm not I can't be mentally ill because I'm still here yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting to know whether the study's been done. Is it, if if it's changed over the years, or it's always been here. It's just talked about more now, and it's being more. I think there's much more visible. openness now. Yeah. Um, there's certainly much more openness about men, and you see this with celebrities about them talking about their mental illness. And I think yeah. there's much more. There is much more. There are greater opportunities for men to talk about it. My worry is that a lot of the time this is happening with celebrities. So celebrities are given the space to talk about their mental illness. The common individual is very different. They might not have the resources. They might not have the skills. They might not have the support network to be able to do that. That's true. Um, so until I think it filters down to be able to say, I'm struggling. But then the other big question is, if you're a celebrity and you say, look, I'm struggling with mental health, there'll be lots of people around to help you through that. I think one of the difficulties with a lot of men is they don't know where to get help. Once you say, I'm struggling, what do you do next? You're like, Where do you get help from? And if you don't know, yeah. you're not going to get help. Um, and this is kind of part of the problem as well, that a lot of health professionals, if they kind of believe and they buy into these myths that men can't get postnatal depression, they might they might miss the fact that a man is asking for help or doesn't know what he's doing or struggling with his mental illness. Yeah. What I always find amazing is that you know, health professionals, there should, there should just be a focus on wanting to make people feel better. They're not a kind of dogma around yeah. what well, men can't get depressed yeah, or yeah. this doesn't really exist. Yeah. And it should just be the focus on, on making people feel better. So my ethos is that e- the whole thing about postnatal depression should be about helping the family unit. Yeah. Um, irrespective of which member of the family unit is struggling. Yeah. Um, if the dad's struggling, he needs care. If the mum's struggling, she needs care. If the child's struggling, he, he or she needs care. So I, th- I think part of the issue for me is that when you remove the dad and you essentially isolate him as a special case to make him immune from postnatal depression or not worthy of care, essentially what you're saying is the whole family unit doesn't require care. Somehow the family unit just needs to plod along until something changes. Presumably if the dad's depressed, it's going to affect mum and baby. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the biggest things we know is that if the dad's depressed, the knock-on effect on mum is huge. Mums are about two and a half times more likely to get postnatal depression if the dad's depressed. Wow. Does um, it work? 
the other way too? Yeah. Um, so it's, right. it's the same experience. So if a mum's postnatal depressed, the man's more likely to get depressed as well. One of the other things we know is that if the dad is struggling, there is a huge knock-on impact on the child as well. So in the kind of very basic stuff, like if you're postnatal depressed, you haven't got the energy to do basic things like wanting to play with your child or read to your child or sing to your child. You may not just have the headspace to do that. Um, you may also respond to your child much more critically. So rather than focusing on the kind of loving and being there for your child, caring for your child, um, you might respond by being much more critical, self-critical. Yeah. Um, I remember there was a two-week period after my, my son was born, and every time I kind of held him, it felt like he was just he just started crying. Um, and a lot of dads talk about the same thing, where they kind of feel like they son or children are rejecting them at that early age when obviously they haven't got that kind of decision making ability so obviously it's a psychological thing but I remember experiencing that and going my son doesn't want me um, and just kind of blaming myself the whole time. That's also some, some we talked about before like the preparation if you've never held a newborn I mean babies yeah. cry yeah. that's yeah. what they do yeah. you know they cry if they're hungry they cry if they need a nappy change whatever yeah. but again, if you're not experienced it again it's just a new a whole new thing yeah. to deal with. How come men are so bad at asking for for help? So it's about masculinity. I think we're not just not socialised to have these kinds of conversations. And this yeah. is an anomaly. I, I think... What we're doing now. Yeah, what we're doing yeah. now is a complete anomaly. I don't think we have often the space to have these kinds of conversations to say I'm struggling. I think a lot of the time when men ask for help, or even if they come close to asking for help, these kind of conversations are shut down, particularly by other men. Other men don't want to hear about your troubles. That's, at least that was my experience. Certainly with the, the other people who I might have asked for help, I don't think I ever felt comfortable asking. And with these like, immediate family yeah, members or uh, close friends? Both family members and close friends. I don't think I would have ever said to them... I think part of that was I didn't know at that time that postnatal depression in men was a thing, so I kind of bought into the myth myself. But also having the conversation where you kind of go, I'm struggling and I don't know what to do, is a really difficult conversation. It's almost, well, to you kind of use a, an old-fashioned term, it's emasculating. Yeah. It feels like you're losing all sense of who you should be as an individual. And my response was to essentially become hyper-masculine in other forms. I'd spent a lot of time in the gym. I'd kind of overworked to the point where I was kind of doing, I don't know, I'd sleep for a couple of hours a day and kind of go straight back to work, well, yeah. um, which was not sustainable. And even more, even worse, contributed to what came later, which is a severe breakdown in my mental state. Do you feel like it's difficult to speak to your wife about it? Because she's obviously going through her own stuff, looking after the kids. I never talked to her properly. And I think part of that was that I I wanted to be the one who looked after the family. Because I wasn't doing very much by this point. I'd kind of almost withdrawn from her so much. And actually not just her, but my son as well. That I'd struggled to say I did anything at all as part of that family. And so to ask her for help felt completely shameful it meant admitting to myself that something was wrong in the first place which I was hesitant to do but then also then saying to her that I need help was really difficult at yeah. what point do you obviously because you, you given the job you do and all the research you're probably more tuned to it than others at what point does someone realize actually I need help is it is it does it come from the individual or, or is it actually the people around them that be like hold on a second you know you should I don't think there is a there is a perfect answer to that question because I think every every individual experience will be specific to how, for example, if you haven't got people who to support you, you might not depend on other people. Um, for example, there's lots of research to suggest that men don't necessarily want to talk to their close relatives, including their partners, about their mental illnesses. They're much more likely to talk, for example, to their barbers. Um, someone right. who's a relative stranger. Uh, so there's a lot of effort at the moment to train barbers to be able to ask the right questions of, of men and then get them the help they need if, if it's necessary. Interesting. Yeah, because I, I guess it's a kind of... it's perceived as a less threatening space almost to be able yeah. to talk to someone who knows you well enough but Just not that well but then if you're a, if you're a barber and you're trained to ask the right questions you can pick up on it and you can get the men the help they need for me i think it took a very long time for me to even acknowledge that something was wrong and i think i'd kind of gone through even at points where i was suicidal i think i kind of still thought to myself there's nothing wrong here this is what all men go through when they just had a baby, um, which is ridiculous now to look back and think, to, to even think that I thought that at the time. Um, my wife essentially saved me, I, I think. Yeah. Well, I think for a start, she didn't abandon me. Um, yeah, yeah. But then she, and this is, I mean this quite literally, she dragged me to the GP and said, have a conversation with the GP, please. Wow. And, and that, did you, had you accepted at that moment? Or? I think even then I thought I was fighting it. I, I right. didn't want to see the GP. I don't think I necessarily had the tools at that point to have a conversation about my mental health 
So even then it was still a struggle, but I think looking back, I'm really glad I did. And this yeah. was the first point at which a health professional had a conversation with me and went, we need to get you some serious help. Right. And how did she identify? Like, there, are there things to look out for if someone's in a similar position? And- so if you're, if you're a health professional, there are, there are diagnostic tools you can use. Essentially, they're kind of questionnaires that men are asked to fill in. And if they score a certain number of points, they're referred for care. Often GPs in particular who've maybe had a history of or had experience dealing with men who have had depression um, may just have a conversation with them and say, you can get routine aftercare through in this borough, for example, through CAMS, um, yeah. the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services. So the different routes into care, but essentially having a conversation with a health professional is the starting point. You've got to do that. Yeah. And how does how can someone, I mean, if they're in the same position as your wife, you know, who... They've, they've obviously are there things to look out for to identify if your husband or partner is is going through the same thing. So I think the kind of common symptoms would be things like a loss of energy. So is your partner still experiencing the, the, and having fun doing the kind of things that they used to? Um, that may even be just things like cooking or cleaning or maybe not cleaning but cooking certainly or going out with their friends. Have they withdrawn socially? Are they still seeing their their old friends? Are they still seeing people regularly? And are they having essentially what we would call social withdrawal? Draw, which is essentially removing themselves from right. the family unit. Are they spending a lot of time on their own? Are they struggling to have conversations? Are they spending time with the child? Uh, those kind of things. I, th- I think it can often be difficult because men aren't very, not all men, but most men aren't don't have the right tools to be able to have these kinds of conversations. Oh, yeah. um, and it takes time to develop. And I think a lot of the time men react with psychological reactants for example if I said to you let's have a conversation about your mental health right now what you might do is shut down the conversation because you don't want to have that conversation so I think placing or giving developing skills and developing tools for men to be able to have those conversations when they require it is really important yeah. I often worry that by the time they're postnatally depressed or by the time they're depressed in general it might already be too late right and then and then the journey to recovery so you <clears throat> you went to the GP mm-hmm. and I mean obviously they asked the right questions and it was at the yeah. Yeah. The thing that sent you on the path. Yeah, I, I often think that there's an expectation that once you're in care, that there is a linear path to recovery. Right. Um, and often it isn't like that. Um, so in my particular case, my GP referred me for psychological um, help, um, which I received for, I think, six or seven months. And I was shifted from that to a parenting class. And is that immediate? So the GP says... Uh, in my case, it was. I th- it was serious enough that I think that they, were, they thought emergency care was necessary. Um, it doesn't always happen and obviously this also means that if we want men I think asking for help is a very important thing but then if you want to help men long term you also need to have um, a funded public health service which is able to help men long term get them the care they need whether it's short term or long term whether it's medication or psychological treatments whatever it is all that needs to be funded somehow yeah um, is it so is, 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 there, is there a barrier of funding then or, or once you're in the process like in the in the system let's say it you, may you, be a very long time so there's a there's a shortage of of mental health care practitioners in the first place and there's a, there's a severe shortage of funding for mental health care in this country all of which means that there might often be long long waiting lists to get seen particularly if you haven't got severe clinical depression right and um, particularly if you're not suicidal for example you may not get immediate care um, interesting presumably though as we discussed by the time a man actually yeah gets yeah. into it i mean yeah. the case is probably quite severe yeah crazy and so what so, so, so you go to the gp the gp refers you yeah um, um, so he referred me to um psychological treatment yeah um which is essentially therapy for a period of six months um, and I went from there to a parenting class run by the local council which was I think for me the was that a mix of, of mothers and I father? was the only dad really <laughs> yeah wow uh, it was a class of I think 12 or 13 right. and I was the only dad which is strange it was nice in the sense that obviously I was it was quite fun for me to be the yeah. only dad how did, did it make you how did it make you feel it made me quite sad because I think I think a lot of dads would benefit from just doing some basic parenting classes in this for me this was this was life changing it gave me the tools to interact with my son for the first time I wasn't reacting by going I hate myself I, I hate life I don't want to spend time with my child I got to the point and this is much later but I got to the point where I was, I was eager to spend time with him and it kind of changed my whole outlook about how I related to him yeah um, so I'm a big advocate for parenting classes and I think a lot of people have this conception that parenting comes later in life that parenting is parenting a five-year-old or a ten-year-old it's not a, a two-year-old a one-year-old needs parenting definitely and just being able to interact with your two-year-old or a one-year-old is life-changing um, but you need to be taught that, yeah. especially if you haven't got the skills to do it. Definitely. So there is there is help available. Yeah, yeah. But I think what we're discussing is that the key barrier is actually for men seek or identifying the need help. Yeah. And then asking for help. Yeah. And then once you're in 
process of funding aside, but there's stuff around that you can you can do. Is there anything else that you, you changed with in your life? I mean, it'd be great to talk about um, exercise and CrossFit, which is where we met. Because I was uh, I saw a talk from uh, Frank Bruno mm-hmm. and Tyson Fury, the both heavyweight boxers, but they both suffered or still suffer from mental health yeah. problems, and both said the big thing for them was seven days a week at the gym yeah have you found the same thing has helped you i am slightly ambivalent about at least my relationship with exercise i think in the long term it certainly helped me when i was postnatally depressed i think i used it as a crutch almost to kind of because i would feel like i wasn't good enough going to the box and going to the gym and being good enough in the gym felt like almost like a replacement for everything else that was shit in my life ah uh, right so i don't i don't know if i developed necessarily a healthy relationship with the gym certainly when i was struggling with my mental health now that i'm in a in a much better better position in terms yeah. of my health i find it very helpful going in i go regularly in the morning and but i just find it, it gives me the kind of boost to be able to have a good day and there's i mean there's tons of research showing that exercises are related with more positive mental health but also more positive body image all kinds of wonderful things I think when you get down to it I think the issue for me is that a lot of men's relationship with the gym is complex it isn't as simple as saying that it's always going to be positively associated with mental health there might be um, an aspect to it which is positive there can also be a lot of aspects which of the gym can be negative particularly if it gets addictive I'm interested you mean you don't feel you're good enough not strong enough and you start thinking about all of these types of things yeah interesting so if you do it in the right way because it produces serotonin and all of these cool things that makes you more positive yeah. and I, I suppose the, the kind of the trick is not to use the gym as a replacement for anything else that you feel is deficient in your life right um, okay like you might be going well, at least I would feel like I would go to the gym and hit certain targets about how much I was lifting or how much I, how many wads I could do or whatever yeah and suddenly feel amazing about myself and meanwhile my relationship with my son was deteriorating to the point where we had very little going on yeah. so I, I don't think it's necessarily always a healthy thing I, I think it has to be managed and I think there is a way of managing exercise that for the individual that can make it a positive thing yeah and then um so so with treatment so it's a mixture of talking to people Mm -hmm. um drugs and and stuff as well so there there are lots of different options available drugs is one of them so medication um it's often prescribed sertraline is the common antidepressant what's it called sertraline okay Uh, it's the common antidepressant that's prescribed for for um, depression I am much more favorable I think it just maybe to my personality to having a conversation with someone and working through what the issues are for me the version of therapy that i went through was called family se- family systemic or family centered therapy um, okay essentially it puts the family unit in in view um, so there would be sessions when i'd take my son into therapy with me and we'd play together and my therapist would watch me playing with him uh-huh. and kind of pick up on things that i might be kind of hiding or not wanting to talk about and it's also about talking about my own relationships with my own parents yeah um, and how that might influence what's happening to me now so i think that kind of holistic perspective is, for me was very useful some people might find the combination of both medication and therapy really helpful there are all kinds of other interventions that have been shown to be helpful with depression yeah and then and then the practitioners suggest and whatever treatment they feel is best and you go through Um, that i I often feel it should be a a two-way um discussion and a decision-making process that's shared either with the gp or the health professional and i think men respond better particularly when they're given some semblance of power in that relationship when they when they're kind of not told this is what you should be doing yeah but this is how we might get you help this is how i might get you better and so if someone's like feeling depressed now and wants to get some help what are the best avenues is it the gp are there any anyone else they can talk to maybe anonymously or um, so there are lots of places you can ask for help for if you're really struggling and you need emergency care go to A&E um, that's your starting point if you're struggling with your health right now um, if you're suicidal go to a call for an ambulance go to any don't yeah. if you feel like you are struggling but you're not sure whether you're struggling have a conversation with your GP if that's possible GPs may not always be receptive I think I was very lucky to have a GP who instantly went this is this is depression and we need to get you some help and GPs may not always react in that way so if it's not the GP maybe have a conversation if you're a dad have a conversation with a midwife or a health visitor yeah. I think the tradition is now changing and health visitors are much better place to have these kind of conversations yeah. with men if you want to talk to someone anonymously try your barber or, yeah. um, is there any um, are there any like child line type um, so I use the Samaritans quite a lot okay um, right they're very helpful for me yeah. they're all kinds of Calm is another good example of a charity working with men um, okay. Mind again is another good example there are all kinds of charities that will be helpful um, one, of th- one thing that I will say is that a lot of men tend to think that depression will just go away um, that it'll just disappear on its own and I don't think I've ever come across a case where that's been that's what's happened it just doesn't go away on its own it will kill you before it goes away on, on its own so get help and don't feel 
that you have to do it on your own. There will be lots of, there will be hundreds, thousands of men who are in the same position as you, all wondering, what do I do with this? I think the starting point is to acknowledge that something is wrong, um, but then also then seeking help. Yeah, and there's a lot more men going through this than you think, right? How yeah. many, what percentage roughly are? So in the UK, we think that between about eight and 11% of new dads will suffer from postnatal depression. Right. Right. I don't know what that translates to in terms of the actual number, but that's a huge percentage of dads. Yeah. Um, is that similar to it's roughly to mums? similar so with mums right. it's about 6 to 13% will suffer right. from postnatal depression in the UK so about 1 in 10 yeah. um, roughly will suffer from Fine. postnatal depression so a lot of people are going through the same thing awesome thank you so much for coming in thanks thank for you. sharing your story and uh, all the advice and everything and see you at the gym yes see you at the gym cool. <laughs> thank you hey folks thanks for listening don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places bye